Most modern smartphones come equipped with accelerometers. If you fire up an app that shows you the data from the accelerometer, like this one, you will notice something. It shows about 9.81 meters per second squared upwards. Here I'm moving the phone to show which axis is which on the screen. So your smartphone believes that you are constantly accelerating upwards. Why? Let's look at how an accelerometer works. A simplest one would just be a weight suspended on identical springs. No acceleration and it will just hang there in the middle. If you accelerate it, the weight will get pulled in the direction opposite to the acceleration, and you can measure the deflection and figure out the acceleration from there. But there is a flaw here. This principle of operation assumes that there are no forces other than inertial forces acting on the weight. But for example, if the weight was magnetic and we put a magnet close to the accelerometer, the weight would get deflected and the accelerometer would be led to believe that it was accelerating. So, is that what is happening? Sounds like it could be. After all, there is a force acting on the weight. The force of gravity. It pulls the weight down so the accelerometer believes it is accelerating up. Problem solved, right? Well, except, according to Einstein, there is no force of gravity. Einstein would say that the accelerometer shows an acceleration upwards because it is accelerating upwards. Okay, but there is a bit of an issue with this, isn't there? Consider two people, one in Spain and one in New Zealand. On a globe, those two would be on the exact opposite sides of Earth. If both of them were accelerating upwards, they would be accelerating away from each other, so the distance between them would have to start growing at some point. But as far as we can tell, the distance between Spain and New Zealand is, well, fairly constant. So it seems like either Einstein or the spherical model of the Earth have to be wrong. Or at least that's what flat earthers who think, and emphasis on think, uh, they understand relativity would have us believe. But fear not, the problem is neither with the globe nor with relativity. As always, it is just a big misunderstanding of the topic at hand. But to see why, we have to dive a bit deeper into what accelerating means in relativity. In relativity, we talk about motion in terms of world lines. A world line is simply a line representing a history of an object in spacetime. Like, say this is our spacetime, reduced to two dimensions so we only have one spatial dimension and one time dimension. Say an object was here at time 0, then here at time 1, here at time 2, and if we plot all those and all the intermediate points, we get a line. This is the object's world line. An important principle of general relativity is this. A world line of a free object is a geodesic. That is the closest thing to a straight line there can be in spacetime, whatever its shape is. For most intents and purposes you can just think of geodesics as straight lines. So to put it in simple terms, unless a force acts on an object, it just keeps going straight ahead in spacetime. And if a force does act on an object, as Newton taught us, it will accelerate. In relativistic terms, its world line will deviate from a geodesic. Let us think for a while about what that means. Looking back to familiar Euclidean geometry for a moment, how do we even recognize that a line is straight? Here we have two lines. One is straight and one isn't. How would we define which is which? One way to do it is to look at lines that are shifted by some constant small distance relative to our lines of interest. In the case of a straight line, regardless which side we shift our line to, it doesn't change its length. But with a curved line it's different. The line on one side is longer than the line on the other side. So one way of defining straight would be, it's a line that doesn't change its length when slightly perturbed. There is a more rigorous phrasing of that in terms of calculus of variations, but we'll make do with this simplified one. We can even recognize which way the line turns by looking at the lengths. If the line gets longer when shifted to one side, that side is the outer side of the turn. The side where it gets shorter is the inner side. And here's one catch. That's how it works in Euclidean geometry. However, in spacetime geometry is the opposite. The diagram should look more like this. So the shorter side is the outer side, and the longer side is the inner side. 
But what is length in space-time anyway? It has a physical interpretation. It's the time a clock would measure if the line was its world line. And that actually means that there is another theoretical way of building an accelerometer using only clocks. Theoretical because the accuracy of the clocks that would be required would be orders of magnitude greater than the accuracy of the best atomic clocks. But still, it would work like this. Instead of a weight on identical springs, have identical synchronized clocks. If the accelerometer gets accelerated in some direction, it means its world line becomes curved. And if it becomes curved, the clock on one side of the curve would start measuring less time than the clock on the other side. The acceleration is then towards the clock that is ticking faster. So in our case, since we know that the weight and spring accelerometer shows us that we are accelerating upwards, consistency would dictate that the clock-only accelerometer has to show the same, which means that clocks have to tick faster the higher up they are, and indeed they do. This is known as gravitational time dilation, but it is a bit of a misnomer. The effect isn't caused so much by gravity as by the fact that observers stationary with respect to the surface are actually accelerating upwards. But that brings us back to the question, how can they all accelerate upwards and not get further away from one another? Let's start with the simplest case of empty space. Then the spacetime is what is called flat, and geodesics are simply straight lines. So if you have multiple objects which start out being at rest relative to each other, meaning their wall lines are initially parallel, being straight lines, they will remain parallel, so the objects will remain at rest, unless something disturbs them. For example, if the objects initially form the sphere, which we will represent as a circle here, because we don't have enough dimensions to have a sphere and still have a time direction in the diagram, they will keep forming a sphere. And if they started accelerating outwards, the sphere would grow. But what if the space is not empty? What if there is some mass inside the sphere? Einstein's equation then says that the volume of such a sphere will start shrinking, at first slowly, then faster and faster. And the rate of acceleration of this shrinking will be proportional to the energy and pressure within the sphere. And remember, mass is also energy. In other words, the presence of mass curves spacetime in such a way that geodesics which start out parallel will begin converging. And that is how mass attracts mass within general relativity. There is no force, spacetime is just distorted so that geodesics converge. But if geodesics converge, it means that if our objects want to remain on the initial sphere, like say on the surface of the Earth, their world lines will have to deviate from geodesics, and this deviation will have to be directed outwards. So, in line with what we talked about before, in order to keep constant distances from each other, the objects have to accelerate outwards. And if those objects were accelerometers, be it spring and weight or clock-only ones, those accelerometers would show an acceleration outwards. Or using everyday terminology, outwards with respect to the Earth is up, inwards is down. So the weights appear to be pulled down, clocks that are higher up tick faster than clocks that are lower, and accelerometers show an acceleration up. This may all seem a bit abstract, so let me show you an example of a space where geodesics converge. A sphere. If we start with two observers on the equator and they both start walking straight ahead towards one of the poles, they will start getting closer and closer to each other, eventually colliding on the pole. If they wanted to keep a constant distance from one another, at least one of them would have to be turning. Or they could both be turning, one slightly left, the other slightly right. And if they turn by just the right amount, they will keep a constant distance. But the moment they stop turning, a collision becomes imminent. And this is basically how this works. The presence of mass curves spacetime, so geodesics cannot remain parallel, and thus keeping a constant distance from other points around the Earth means having to deviate from a geodesic, that is, accelerate upwards. No contradiction, just slightly unintuitive geometry. One last thing for completeness. The notion of accelerating I described here is usually called proper acceleration. 
There is also coordinate acceleration, which is dependent on the coordinate system, and is just the second rate of change of coordinates with respect to time. In coordinates tied to the Earth, such coordinate accelerations are zero for objects that are at rest relative to the surface. But coordinate accelerations are not what accelerometers measure. They measure proper acceleration, and that is non-zero. And that is all for today. Thanks for watching and see you in the next one.